Okay, I think we're ready to begin. So I'm here to introduce you to Derek Sheffield. I think it's really uh, healthy and uh, refreshing for regular people to walk around in the world with poets because they reintroduce you to the world that you thought you knew. So just walking from my house, which is about a mile from here, to this room with Derek is to be made aware of uh, the birds in the trees that I don't know and the flowers growing in along people's uh, houses that I don't know. And are there a lot of black locust trees in this neighborhood? Um, I think you'll find that Derek is a poet of sensitivity, of great sensitivity and a deep attention and awareness of the non-human world. I'm going to read uh, some information, his credentials here. It's a little paragraph. So Derek's uh, book of poems, Through the Second Skin, was a finalist for the Washington Book Award and the Walt Whitman Award. His poems have also appeared in Poetry, The Georgia Review, Orion, Shenandoah, and The Southern Review, and were given special mention in the 2016 Pushcart Anthology. He teaches poetry and ecological writing at Wenatchee Valley College, serves as the poetry editor of terrain.org, and he lives with his family in the foothills of the Cascades near Leavenworth, Washington. So please welcome Derek. Okay, well, hi. So, uh, thank you, Kurt. That was a lovely introduction. And um, I was planning on thanking you anyway, so now I can thank you twice. Uh, thank you to Kurt Caswell and Diane Warner, for they are the two reasons I am here at uh, this, this uh, treasure of a gathering. And I mean the gathering happening this weekend and also the gathering that stays here in the boxes down the hall. So um, actually before I read you anything, I, um, I'm here to actually introduce another poet. Last night at uh, Kurt's house, a few of us were talking about poetry and um, suddenly we noticed that uh, Morgan, uh, had disappeared from our midst and gone, slipped out to his camper, uh, Kurt's camper, in the driveway. And he came back um, an hour or two later, and he had been writing some poems while we had been talking about poems. And so I asked Morgan Howell if he would share one of his poems that he wrote last night and has actually since revised. Um, by way of introduction, I could say that uh, Morgan Howell is a patriot of the wilderness of Colorado. Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm going to be reading The Woods. It's one of my poems that I wrote last night that Derek said. And so here it goes. <clears throat> the mountain wind blows across your face. You look up. You see the clear blue sky and the white clouds. 
and the whispering of the creek. You are in the woods. Of course, am fully aware that everything I read now will pale in comparison, and that is as it should be. Um, Morgan left us in the woods, and so that's where I will start in the woods. And um, it was my privilege, and I use that word intentionally, it was my privilege to uh, have a residency in the Kentucky hardwoods. I lived in a cabin there for a month. And um, this is a poem rooted in that experience my first experience of, of the South and, uh, and the hardwoods. And it's called the Bernheim Forest, and it has an epigraph. In 1929, Isaac Wolf Bernheim purchased over 12,000 acres of eroded and logged out land in Bullitt and Nelson counties in Kentucky and established the I.W. Bernheim Foundation as a means of protecting and managing this living legacy. This is from the Bernheim Arboretum and Research Forest website. There's no doubt who's responsible. His name is everywhere on signs, vans, jackets, walls, and without that name, these third growth woods would be no growth. When the heaps of green cash he made from whiskey made this, he risked everything by posting a sign, all welcome, regardless of race or religion. Inside these boundaries, tags like Weeping Pine and Tupelo say these thousand shades of green will not be taken. Outside are children like Tamir and Trayvon, shades of brown, in and towns like Lynchburg. Outside, noose holes in the rules let coal companies shear off the tops of mountains. One of the signs planted streamside here quotes Leopold's, we grieve only for what we know. Another slope of hardwoods and nest sites just down the road. Every moment I have been here has been going, going, and another boy. Now, take a breath. Nothing like the smell of highway in the morning and evening and all afternoon. Nothing like a dead child. It's all clear cut from above, from the vantage of the black vultures who float these skies. I'm with them in the air now and heading home, having done not enough beyond wishing, like Bernheim, we could fly like that, like them, feathers cupped and open instead of burn and blast. A girl in a window seat looks down at the ravaged earth, bladed mounds and parallel slashes, pressing her forehead to the glass. And the man next to her loosens his tie in a whiff of cologne. And his seat, already tipped, turns on his phone and frowns as he slides a finger over something needing his attention. I was thinking about 
uh, Tony Jensen's piece yesterday, the women in the frack lands, very striking um, piece uh, that I think is raises important questions and is true to the complexity of um, of those various addictions of which she writes. And I was thinking, uh, and one of the questions there is, what what is the culture that uh, creates this? And um, and one of the poems that we have published in Terrain.org's Letter to America series, I think may address this. And as it happens, it is by a West Texas boy named Christian Wyman. Club. Rich men whose souls are silos from which their lives have long been launched, squeak as they sink in deep, embosoming chairs. How they love their nooks of oak and 19th century light. They do not mind the golden rule, as it is called, not to speak of business here. They do not need to. Even now, out in the screech and lurch, this peace obliterates money, immunity, metastasizes. Attended by brief embodiments, shadows with hands, living whispers, the rich men nod their needs. And when they've downed one dusk, they have another. This morning, Kurt shared with us uh, some statistics that he gleaned in a book Barry Lopez recommended to him called Learning to Die in the Anthropocene. And thank you, Priscilla, for uh, complexifying that term. or pointing out the complexity of using it. Stewards at work. It would be fine to save a few trees, especially those limber ones that bow whenever we send down our storms. Some bushes too, sedges and grasses clump agreeably. If we keep the cattails, the blackbirds whose shoulders we dabbed with red kiss marks will linger like the coals of that first fire. Remember? Rocks and pebbles, yes, and boulders with sparkly dots. Night should continue covering up and day go on exposing. Let's not forget those dusky gnats and that white-faced dog behind every replicated fence. Let's have her pace a little longer the length of every yard then stop and perk her ears towards something always coming that never quite arrives. I uh, was not planning on reading this until I heard Jill's um, presentation on Gretel Ehrlich's work. And so I think in appreciation of her presentation and that work, um, I, I'm going to have to read this one. And, and also, I would like to uh, send this out to uh, all of us um, who are going to be out uh, standing with the scientists tomorrow. There's, there are a lot of um, marches and demonstrations in support of science and scientists. And um, this poem, I've, I've uh, had the great 
fortune through the Spring Creek Foundation of twice um, having uh, field residencies at Mount St. Helens um, at the 30th anniversary of the big eruption and then uh, five years later at the, the 35th. And uh, in each case, these field residencies entailed living for a week uh, in the slopes of Mount St. Helen in the shadow of Mount St. Helens and accompanying scientists in their research for a week. And uh, then my job was to make poetry in response to that, make poems. And so on the most recent field residency there, I uh, learned that there is a uh, scientific debate about Mount St. Helens, about whether to call these, um, these blasts of superheated air and rock and, and mud as, um, as blasts or surges, whether they're, it's a surge or a blast. And I, I have to say I love scientists there. You know, and I think one thing that, um, that so many people don't understand is the scientific temperament and is um, the notion of, of how they are reflective skeptics and that if the empirical data showed that climate change was not happening, they would be the first first to, uh, to leap on that and, um, and show us. And, and they also, too, they are not people prone to exclamation. Um, I actually, th I thought Kurt was a scientist or a Buddhist the first time I met him because he has this, met him, he has this uh, kind of namaste about him, you know, or, and, and the scientists have that too, my scientist friends, um, that I don't have. Um, uh, and so I sure appreciate that in them. So this is a poem called Blast and Surge after Robert Frost and the gathering of scientists at Mount St. Helens. Some say blast is what happened here. Some say surge. From what I've tasted of dust deviled ash, I'm with those who favor blast. What if it had to happen again and again to the age of the earth? I think I know enough of heat to say that for delete, surge is also just a word. What does it mean, asks one as we stand upon a plain of gray rock and look up to a steaming crater. Behind us, shrubby trees make patchy surges of creeping return. As they crisscross the air around our knees, grasshoppers click their yellow wings. They mean to find each other and breed in the heat we mean to stop making. Um, I've uh, usually in the past one of those guys who will send checks to organizations and and um, and that's about it uh, to the uh, Audubon and Sierra Club and um, working assets and places like that uh, uh, ACLU um, and then you know haven't really had time to be much engaged in um, direct protest social justice activities um, but Recently, um, movements like Black Lives Matter and the Women's March and the uh, Dakota Access Pipeline changed that. And as it turned out, I, as it turns out, I've I've become a protester. Uh, who knew? You know, usually I'm I'm the guy too busy doing stuff. And so, um, but I think it's a different time, and um, and I'm a different person. So um, I've lived in Wenatchee, in the Wenatchee Valley for many years, um, whatever, like 19, 20 years now. I, I uh, landed out there after graduate school, and uh, had always, and, and this, 
this aspect of our town um, is some, something that I've, been, I've given a lot of thought to over the years, but had never written about and until after I was out in front of Wells Fargo shaking signs about um, I was standing with Standing Rock um, and got some of my um, former students and, and, um, and friends to join us. Um, <clears throat> and so this is, uh, this is a little, this is a little bit of um, my town here for you. It's called the Skookum Indian of Wenatchee, Washington since 1921. Above the office depot, those dark eyes move back and forth all day and night. Now and then, one of them winks. He's a giant motorized head, this Indian of ours, with a cartoon nose and long dark braids. Above the office depot, those dark eyes shadow us wherever we drive, oblong holes welded to a wobbling sky. Now and then, one of them winks. A grin wide as a sunset that won't die promises a business no longer alive beside the office depot, those dark eyes. We mostly forget but tourists want pictures of those big cheeks, red as the apples they've come to buy. Now and then, one of them winks back. His name means brave or monstrous, and the feather on his head tilts like a missile rising from the ground. Above the office depot, those dark eyes now and then, one of them winks. I was um, not planning to read this poem either, but I want to read it um, in appreciation for Priscilla's work um, on uh, Mexican Americans and, and um, their relationship to um, to the environment and, uh, and that culture. And one of, one of my failures as a poet is uh, I don't make stuff up much. I just kind of capture things. I come floating by and I um, I'm working on making more stuff up, okay? So we'll see how that goes. Uh, and this is another parody um, of a James Wright poem. Um, James Wright was a poet, came out of Ohio, and a um, uh, nature poet, has a poem that many of us know called A Blessing. Report, oh, I gotta tell you one more thing um, that I think will uh, deepen your appreciation of the poem. This comes from a trip my colleague and I took. We were, we were driving to a humanities conference. Report from America Authentico, after James Wright. Just off the highway to Tacoma, my friend and I stop for gas in North Bend. While he buys sweet rolls wrapped in cellophane, I use the restroom. On the metal frame above the stall door, I read nigger slash Mexican bar. Because I'm as white as the man who wrote it, it takes a few moments before I see the rope around a dark neck. Jesus, I think, the seat a frigid halo against my skin. I'm afraid the clerk will sh shrug as if this is another joke is in your hand. I'm afraid she'll see my friend licking sugar flakes from his queer fingers 
and call the boys. She's outside smoking a generic cigarette. A line of smoke jets from the corner of her mouth. Son of a bitch, she mutters, having scrubbed it off three times already. She is too thin, and her hair falls flat as road dust in the gasolined air. I am home once more as her break ends with a stubbed promise. I just might lock that door. Bye-bye. The animal of winter is dying, its white body everywhere in collapse and stabbed at by straws of light, a leaving to believe in as the air slowly fills with darkness and water drains from the tub where my daughter, watching it lower around her, feeling it go says about the only thing she can, as if it were a long-kept breath going with her blessing of dribble and fleck. Down it swirls a living drill vanishing toward a land where tomorrow already fixes its bright eye on a man muttering his way into a crowd, saying about the only thing he can before his body goes boom. And tomorrow I will count more dark shapes tumbling from the sky, birds returning to scarcity, offering in their seesawing songs a kind of liquidity. Well, since I met Morgan Howell, I'm uh, lamenting the fact that I didn't bring uh, my daughter with me. And so, here's a, here she is in language. Three. We do not ask about her PJs or the bear under her arm as she crawls naked into our bed and shoves and knees us to the edges. All we can do is curl into a ball and gently, oh God, not let go of the spider strand of sleep drifting through the darkness. Silence, warmth, and then a scratchy voice. Dad, your breath stinks. Dad, bears will eat people. Um, I have come to understand that it's a hell of a thing to be a parent. It's, um, it's choosing to love, it's choosing to open yourself, and not just to love and joy, but when, you, when you're open, as you know, your parents, and I suppose others, others too, when you walk around and you're open, um, everything comes through. First grade. Sunday afternoon, and she looks up from her drawing, wants to know if I know the game 
where you put your head down and thumb up until someone picks you. Yes, I say, across the room and half listening. Well, I always pick my friends, but they never pick me. I pause in the middle of a sentence. Who are your friends? Everyone, she says, as if I had asked one plus one or the color of the sky. Sunlight draws a skewed rectangle across the floor. I see, I say, and let my notebook close, seeing children in rows, heads on desks, her big ears poking through sandy hair, listening for a breath or a step. Yes, I remember that game. And I stand and walk over to find the outline of her hand plunging through a white sky. And um, I would like to finish today with just two more poems. She gathers rocks wherever she goes. Make that sticks, no, leaves, which is to say heads of flowers and hips. More river than daughter, her arms fill with treasures of every trail. Hold this, she says, to make us her buckets, her pockets already clack and bristle full. It goes fast, they say, and it was going as they said it, for it's gone into us, counting to five, five times a day, saying, time for bed, time to wake, time to leave. And it's gone into her, quickening eyes and stride that have left us among all the things she once believed she couldn't leave behind. <clears throat> and um, this is a, uh, so this is, here's a nature poem for this gathering of, of nature writers and, and such. Uh, a few years ago, a friend of mine and his wife had the surprise of a third child. A third child was on his way. And so shortly after that um, news, my friend came to me and he said, um, so hey, you know, um, I've been thinking about, uh, 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 he said, uh, he said um, have you gotten that done yet? And I said, well, no, I haven't gotten that done. He said, have you thought about getting that done? I said, well, yeah, I've thought about getting that done. And um, so he had, uh, turns out he'd done some research and had found a, um, a doctor in Seattle, uh, and that's all he does all day. He does that. And um, so um, we ended up taking a trip. Um, his son, by the way, so I guess it's, it's about six years ago, because his son, I think, is about six. Um, I actually, I forget the boy's name because we all call him Bonus. <laughs> and uh, you won't be surprised to hear that this poem, this poem is called Getting It Done. It is for Dr. Charles Wilson. Naked below the waist and on your back, your doc you shake your doctor's hand. Call me Chick, he says snapping on a pair of gloves. You've never heard that one, but you'd rather a chick did what this man is about to do than your logger neighbor, Doug. You've driven two mountain passes to get to Seattle and this specialist's reputed pianist's touch, and you can't see him knobbing a skitter through the stumps of a clear cut. 
get her done is not bumper stuck to the rear of his Prius. No, you're certain as you lie with your legs open, you've found a woodsman of another kind whose fingertips have butterfly kissed the keys of countless men and counting, little Amadeuses that just now adjust a gooseneck lamp, deftly tape your shaft to your belly and begin to swab your scrotum. Your eyes fix upon the photo deliberately hung for all the men who have lain here and all the Richards to come. Do his knights swim with lampreys, condoms riddling every slosh and slither, salt return to salt and blind migrations of the ribbed and the tipped? It's a family in what looks to be a park and, and an oh escapes your mouth as if you're about to sing, say can you, as chick digs for a vase like a granny after a weed. One hand pinches a clamp on every furtive strip of your hog soul while the other pelts the left testicle with lidocaine. The mother and daughter watch as the father tosses the son into the air, arms upraised in a skewed you, their smiles framed in bright swarms of autumn leaves. Chick, too, is smiling as he hands you a pocket knife that bears his clinic's name. And you're up and walking like a man with an egg on a spoon, mincing past the receptionist who nods as if, come again, is about to slip from her lips. A pale man in the waiting room watches your every step to the glass door and out into the rinsed air of April, a breath of fluttery forms and teetering songs and stems everywhere about to bloom. I had the great pleasure of uh, reading uh, with Sherman Alexie at the Skagit River Poetry Festival a couple years ago. And I sat down after that next to Sherman. He turns to me and he says, the vasectomy clinic? Yeah. Yeah. So now you know something about Sherman. <laughs> so um, any, uh, any questions? Oh, yeah, okay. Well, thank you all. Yeah.